Now we're going to move on to chapter two of the book. Chapter two is a very long chapter, and um, there's so much information in chapter two that I cannot cover all of it. So I will probably do a second video just for two points that he makes for chapter two in this that could I could easily explain for 10, 15 minutes by themselves. So. All right, everybody. So, hey, at the end of the last video, I said that I would do a follow-up review for just a few points. I think it's four points in chapter two. Just It was too much information to put on the first video. And I wanted to give that information its due course. Okay, so again, on chapter two, toward the back of that chapter, starting on page 36, he starts talking about selecting seeds. He makes a really funny point here, and I think us as growers and gardeners, we can all feel the exact same way that he does, because this is exactly how I feel. So he says, I have four favorite days of the gardening year. The first day is when the big seed catalog comes. I did a video specifically on when I got the Baker Creek seed catalog. I love that company. I love that book. Uh, I sit there with a pen and I start circling and highlighting and writing down page numbers and getting excited. So Brian, I totally get you there. Who doesn't like getting that package in the mail of all those seeds and all the potential that that package holds in your hand? Love it, love it, love it. Okay, the day that we sow the seeds. Yes, that to me is tedious, but it's fun tedious. Um, it does get overwhelming when you look at a clean canvas and you're like, oh my gosh, look at all the seeds that I have to, <laughs> that I have to sow. But at the same time, there's that excitement about doing that work. So, totally get it. And the last one that he, he points out is when the seeds break through the ground, when they those little plants start to come up then you start to truly see the potential of what your garden has in, in store and what it can be so totally get that what i want to talk about is selecting seeds and he spends a lot of time on page 37 talking about the four types of seeds and i'm going to list them right here gmo seeds hybrid seeds open pollinated seeds and heirloom seeds now I'm gonna cover these kind of quick. Uh, GMO seeds, for the most part, we're not gonna get as backyard gardeners. They cost a lot of money, and the big seed companies, the big farms, they kind of hold on to those like gold. They're, they're not gonna normally release them to the public. A, a hybrid seed, though, is it might seem, seem like a weird thing, but it's basically, if you have two different types of tomato plants growing next to each other, and the bee goes from tomato plant A and then pollinates tomato plant B with the pollen from A. B's fruit is now a hybrid. So the seeds inside that fruit are hybrid seeds. So if you were to save those seeds and grow them for the next year thinking you're gonna get that exact same plant that you got this year, you're not. Those seeds have been changed, they've been mutated. They are now a hybrid seed. Open pollinated seeds are basically any seed that will be pollinated by the wind, birds, or insects. And again, just like with the hybrid, you want to, if you wanted to keep that seed safe, you'd have to make sure that you keep them from being cross-pollinated. So it basically have to be in a greenhouse. It'd have to be one type of plant, one variety of plant to ensure that there's no outside cross-pollinating going on. Um, but that's what an open pollinated seed is. And then heirloom seeds. Now, he mentions that there's a debate on how long it takes for an heirloom seed to become an heirloom seed. He says between 50 to 100 years is the norm. Uh, heirloom seeds, again, are seeds that the genetic code of that plant, that seed, has not been mutated, has not been changed over time. So, think of how long that would take and how tedious that would be to ensure that that plant does not get cross-pollinated. That's crazy. But most people buy heirloom seeds. I know when I look... Um, on the seed catalogs, they'll say heirloom, 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 heirloom. Um, I get whatever seed looks cool. Whatever plant 
seems like, man, that'll be a fun plant to grow. Um, that's why my single seed challenge plant for this year are spoon tomatoes. When I saw that picture, those little teeny tiny tomatoes, the size of peas sitting in a spoon, I was like, done. Absolutely doing that for the single seed challenge. And that was an heirloom tomato. So those are the four types of, of seeds. Now, moving on is the part that can really get fun and can really be stressful. And that's when you're starting your seeds. So on page 38, he talks about quite a few different things, but one of the biggest things he talks about is the growing medium. So I like to use this kind of seed starting mix, Jiffy. I'm not affiliated with Jiffy in any way, shape or form, but I've had absolutely no problems at all with that seed starting mix. But getting the right kind of seed starting mix that you feel comfortable with is the most important thing. For me, it's that one. And I've tried, I think, four different types between last year and this year. And that one, the Jiffy one, is the one that has done the best for me, for me. So he talks about when you're, when you're starting your seeds in a growing median, that's like a seed starting tray, which we'll get to in just a second. But you want a soil that, or basically a mix, that is very well draining. You don't need a lot of nutrition in a seed starting mix. You just need the median to be able to hold the seed, nurture the seed, and when those little roots start to grow, to let the roots, to have plenty of drainage so those roots can stretch out and search, and then that little plant can start to grow. So your growing median is very important. Choosing a container to sow your method, to sow your seeds. Now I use these this year. It's got a removable tray. It's got a little dome that comes on top of it. Um, I like the thought of this because you could see the roots inside as they start to grow. Uh, the only problem with this is getting the seeds out is a very difficult thing to do. So I am probably changing up what I'm going to start my seeds in next year. Haven't decided yet, or maybe later this year when I start the fall seeds and some of the summer seeds actually. So uh, more to come on that and follow up videos. But your method for sowing is super important, whether you're gonna sow directly into the ground or you're gonna start your seeds inside, you know, four to six weeks before the average frost, the, the last average frost date hits. Whatever you choose to do, your growing soil and your growing container are very, very important. You wanna ensure that what you choose to do is the best method for you. And he talks about that on page 39. He also talks about using peat pellets. You know those little pellets and I don't have any because I hate those things. Personally, I don't like them. I will never use them again. I used them last year and I had probably a 30% success rate with those things. Um, even using a heat mat, the lights, the humidity dome, all that, I don't like them. Now, if they work for you, great. Drop a comment down below and give some feedback on how they, how you've used them, how they've worked good for you. But for me, no, I do not like them. And he, I even put it in here, hate these things. Um, I, no, I don't like them. Okay, everyone. So I decided to change up locations. Who wants to see the same background the whole, for a whole video? So I went ahead and moved out here. And to be honest, I'd rather be out in the garden. Now, there's a bird up in this tree. Okay, that tree behind me, I guess he moved. That just will not shut up. So hopefully, <laughs> you don't hear him too much in this video. Okay, so for the next part of this, he talks about grow, uh, um, growing and transplanting your seedlings. I don't know what's more important, whether it's the starting of the seedlings or the transplanting of the seedlings. Me, I would probably say the transplanting because you're now taking that plant from that little seed, that potential, and you're putting it in the ground where it can start growing. So growing your seeds, let's start right off the bat. I don't think this bird likes me. I don't know. So if you're gonna grow your seeds indoors, he talks on page 40 
about your lights, what type of lights to get. Now, one thing I definitely did is I had them too high above the, the seeds. So all my seeds were real thin and stringy. Moving forward, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna totally change up the way that I do my seeds. But he talks about something that I've never heard of. When I went to Amazon, I found some lights, I read the reviews, and I read some reviews, and I decided to say, to, I just decided on some lights to get. I didn't know anything about these. What he talks about are lumens and kelvins. Now the difference are lumens, lumens represent how bright the light gets. Kelvins represent the color of the light. Now, not necessarily the color that we can see, more the color spectrum that the plants see. And now he does talk about in here that you wanna have your lights no more than about three inches above your seed trays. Or if you're gonna start them in say solo cups, about three inches above those cups. The higher the light is from the cup or from the seeds, the further that that plant will start to stretch toward that light. So if you have the light way up here, well, it's, you're gonna have these long, thin, stringy plants that probably won't survive when you bring them outside. I mean, they might. Me, I've had almost no luck, um, just being honest. Very little luck once I move them outside which we'll get into hardening off here in a second. I'm probably not doing it right, but it's all good. Um, he does say here, if your seedlings are too far from the light source, even for a couple of days, you will begin to see the main stems stretch and elongate toward the light, a condition called getting leggy. So that's the part of using lights. Now he goes straight into what, if you're starting seeds indoors, you have two things. You have your light system and you have your heat map or your heat system. I bought a new heat mat for this year and that thing did great. It's super long, I mean, it's really big, wide. It, it covered pretty much an entire fold up table that I had to put all my seeds on. Uh, only problem is that I had, was that I had that light too high, but using a heat mat is very, very important because it's giving that bottom part of the seed tray warmth that will then create the germination process of your seeds. So you have to have a combination of a good median, a good seed starting mix, good seeds, a light source, and a good heat mat. Those four things, and you're good to go when you start to start your seeds. And he talks about it all in here. He also talks about moisture and how important like a humidity dome is for your seed trays, but the trick to a humidity dome that I didn't know is once the plants start to grow, get that humidity dome off. You got to start then letting the plant deal with the environment. And I didn't know that. I thought, hey, I'm going to keep the humidity dome on and create like a greenhouse. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay, now he puts a tip in here that to me I think is one of the most important things um, that I've noticed about starting your seeds and that's, called, that's using a fan, using an oscillating fan. Now I did a video on this a few months ago, um, or a couple months ago, where I explain just how important that fan is to the growth of your plant. Um, if you think of it this way, if you've never heard of using an oscillating fan, I'll break it down, I'll break it down like this. If you're in a controlled environment, and you, have, you don't have any wind and your plant and you're, you are a plant and you're growing, if you have nothing to sway, well then the body of your plant, the, your body is not strengthening. Each time that plant moves, the fibers inside that stem get stronger. So plants that you plant outside, as the seeds start to grow outside, they're always getting hit with nature, with wind. So they're strong, but if you start them inside with no wind in a controlled environment, once you bring them outside, the wind kills them, knocks them over because their bodies aren't strong enough. They're only strong enough to stretch toward that light. They're not strong enough to survive in nature. So I started using an oscillating fan last year and um, 
this year my plants were a lot stronger now i didn't harden them off the right way so i lost a lot of them but as far as their strength in their stems you got to use that oscillating fan if you're going to start them inside right when they start to pop up through the ground put that fan on now it doesn't have to be strong you just want the stems moving that little bit every time it's growing strengthens it turns it into a really strong plant plus putting a fan on helps control the top layer of the soil from and it will dry out the top layer of the soil which is a good thing because it keeps the fungus and those little fungus gnats those little punks that fly around um, keeps them from having a place to lay their eggs and grow the bad thing about a fan is you have to constantly check the water level of your seeds so keep that in mind but an oscillating fan to me is a very powerful weapon and again I did an entire video on that topic now moving on to hardening off your plants this is a process where you take your inside seeds which are in a controlled environment and you start bringing them outside now you don't want to do what I did last year and just take them from inside to outside and then wonder well why are they all dying well because I shocked them to death literally the inside is controlled. There's only so much light that hits them. There's only so much heat that hits them, wind. You get the point. Once you bring them outside, well, now you're dealing with nature. And nature is nature. So you want to start a process called hardening them off. And I'm not going to go into all of it. It's on page 41. He explains it beautifully and in very, very, very much detail exactly what to do. But in, in essence, you're going to start bringing them outside for a couple hours every day. Probably a week or, week or 10 days before you actually want to transplant. And you want them to start getting kind of used to the outside in little tiny spurts. You don't want to just shock them and throw them outside and be like, hey, here you go. Because they're all going to say, no, I'm done and die. So do the process called hardening off. And again, that's on page 41. And his examples and explanation of how to do this is beyond perfect. Like it is dead on. Um, I don't want to give away everything, but there is an amazing way of doing the hardening off that he explains. And I will start doing it this way from here on out. Um, great, great knowledge right there. Okay, so that's everything about seeds. Selecting your seeds, starting your seeds, the lights, the heat mats, everything that you need for seeds. Now we're gonna move into something that I know quite a lot about because of what my previous job was. And that is compost. Okay, everyone, so here, for the final part of this video, we're gonna talk about compost. Now, he spends quite a lot of time talking about compost, four pages worth of talking about compost. And I know you're gonna think, well, four pages isn't a lot, but you can cram a lot of information in four pages. And that's what he does here. Okay, so in this book, he talks about organic gardening. Like every everything about this book, besides the companion planting, is the relationship of companion planting with organic gardening. And you can't have organic gardening without compost. I mean, let's be real. That's what you're using in your garden to fertilize, compost. So he makes a great point here. Compost is the life of your soil. It is incredibly easy to make at your own home or at your home. You can use any organic matter to create compost. A lot of people will use cardboard that doesn't have all that film and that shiny stuff, that glossy um, coating on it, you know, just basic cardboard. You could take the from your paper shredder at work, bring it home, and add that as a part of your compost. You mix brown compost with the green compost, which we're gonna go into in just a minute. But your compost becomes the lifeblood of your garden. So for me, when I brought home all this new soil to become basically the foundation of my raised beds, I then amended everything with compost. Now, whether I made it myself or I bought bags of compost and brought it home and mixed it and aged it, however you want to do it, just do it. But compost is very, very important. Now, the benefits of compost are 
astronomical. Besides the fact that you're going to help all the microorganisms through the soil grow and multiply and nurture them, you're bringing in earthworms because the earthworms are going to find that compost. And when you get out earthworms in your soil, well, they're creating those tunnels that then aerates the garden, which then creates these little avenues where all the um, mycorrhizal fungi and everything else starts to travel. There's a billion benefits for using compost. Now he goes into talking about the benefits, the sources of compost. Compost is abundant in macro and micro nutrients as well as the minerals necessary for your garden to thrive. So there you go. Compost, compost, compost. Sources of compost. Again, you can buy it or you can make it. Now, I have a compost bin that I got last year um, as a present and I've been using it. As you can see here, it has the dual chamber. So for six months, I do one side, six months, I do the other side. And then I empty it and mix that all through the garden. Now, the important thing is what you put in your in your compost. You want to put only vegetables that don't have oils on them. You want your vegetables to be as natural as possible. So if you boil them, as long as you didn't add anything to them, use them. Okay, he does put a general rule here that I love. I'm going to sh show a picture of it right here. It's on page 43. As a general rule, compost is best added as a top mulch as a mulch to the top of the soil. That's how I use my compost um, even now. Whenever I want to amend the beds or if I need to add a layer of mulch to the top of beds, that's what I use, a two inch layer of compost. That does two things. It creates a mulch layer, which helps retain moisture into the soil. And two, it adds the nutrients to the soil. So you're constantly amending your soil and that's one way of doing it is adding a top layer of mulch, of a top layer of compost to your beds, which I will do to the potato bed very soon. Now on page 44 and 45, he talks about the different types of composting. You have hot composting, cold composting. Um, really, it's, it's really, um, to know the difference, it's, it's really simple. Cold composting is when their compost pile doesn't get really hot, it stays cold. Hot composting is when the compost pile gets really hot and it starts to really break everything down. What you want to go for if you're doing a hot compost is for a sustained amount of, you want the temperature to stay sustained. That way any seeds that might fall in there get cooked and killed. And then you don't have volunteer plants growing all over your garden. Um, it also helps break down the material quicker to where then you can use that compost material faster. Cold composting takes a lot longer because everything's breaking down at a very, very slow rate. Um, whichever composting is best for you is what you should do. Technically, my composting style and the compost bins that I have would be a cold compost because I can't keep it hot enough in there. Now, if you were to build your own compost bin where you can, where you've got more material then you can create a hot one because you can keep stirring the compost, which every time you stir it, you're adding air and you're adding life to that compost where it might've been dormant. Now it's alive again and starts breaking down. He talks about how to build your own pile. I won't get into, but most important thing to understand about composting is what I mentioned earlier, green materials and brown materials. Now green, Think of green as anything that will produce nitrogen. So coffee grounds, tea bags, grass clippings, fruit and vegetable scraps, which is what I add to mine a lot. Then he goes into the different manures that you can add to that. Now that's the green side, what will add nitrogen, but you have to have a good mixture of the brown side uh, materials also, which would be like dead leaves, um, corn stalks, pine needles, wood ash, um, uncoated, that's what it is, uncoated cardboard, um, newspapers, newspaper clippings, shredded paper from work. Um, that's the brown side and the brown materials produce carbon. So you have to have that mixture of the green with the brown. And if you don't, like for me, if I don't, I don't have trees here, so I don't get a lot of dead leaves. So what I would do is I would bring home shredded paper from my last job 
and add it to the bins along with all the fruits and um, all the fruits and eggshells and all that that I would put in there. So that's how I kept my green and brown mixture going. Okay, and then to finish up composting, I'm gonna finish with some helpful tips, tips that he leaves here that are just be very, very important. First one, this is something I did from the beginning, just thinking that it makes sense, and apparently it does make sense. Yeah, it's in the it's number one tip. To accelerate the decomposition process, add some finished compost to each new batch. Well, that makes sense. Add some good old stuff to the beginning of the new stuff. The old stuff will have all those microbes and all the bacteria, the good bacteria in there, and they'll immediately start spreading and breaking down the new material. Makes sense. You wanna keep the moisture of your compost bin basically like if you, if you wring out a sponge and you fill it, that's what you want. If you live in a very wet climate, use a tarp. You don't want it too wet. Too, if your compost is too wet, it defeats the purpose and it stops the decomposition process and then it can start to really smell bad. So um, keep that in mind if you're up in like Seattle. All right, and the last thing is you don't want the pieces in your compost to be too big. In other words, you don't want to put big old branches in there. You want little pieces. So say you have a melon, right? Uh, let's say, say you have a pumpkin. You don't want to just put the pumpkin in. You want to cut it up into as many pieces as you can to put in. One, that creates more surface area for the bacteria to latch onto, and two, you don't want this giant blob taking up all that space. You want to break it up, cut it up, chop it up, and put it in there so you can spin or turn your compost and it all works together. Um, but composting is very important. Uh, whether you buy it or you make it, either way, you got to have compost. And for an organic, for an organic garden, it's a must-have. So that chapter, um, those four pages from page 42 to 45 are very, very important and a, uh, a must read and red ink it, highlight it, do whatever you need, but really understand composting. It is very important. All right, everyone. So that's the end of this video. Again, I wanted to spend some time specifically on these few, on these four topics because of how important I think they are. Um, how good is your garden if you don't get the right seeds or if you don't start the seeds correctly or have the right compost or any compost or if you're not doing all the steps that you need to do in order for your plants to grow and be healthy. So again, I just wanted to focus on those topics in this video. Now the next video will be chapters um, four through six and then I'll finish off the book um, the following video after that. So I hope everyone's been enjoying this. Uh, I have actually enjoyed going back through and rereading the book for a second time, focusing more on how I can relay the review of this book to you all through what I have done so far in my garden. Showing the examples that I've done has been fun. And then going back and um, going through the videos and finding the clips to back up what he talks about in here and why I find this book so important because it's stuff that I didn't know about, but that I was doing. And um, for those of you that have not read his book, I'm gonna put the Amazon link to this book down below. So just click and go and order this book for yourself, a gift, um, whatever. But I really, truly believe you cannot go wrong reading this book. And um, I think he did an amazing job. So won't beat a dead horse on that. I will end this by saying, if you all enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Check me out on Facebook and Instagram. It's Down Home Backyard Gardening. And as always, what I like to say at the end of all my videos is shine bright and harvest hard. Bye. Of course, and when the seeds come, who doesn't like getting that packet in the mail of all that, that of all, Who doesn't like getting the light? A condition called getting leggy.
not getting jiggy, getting leggy. <laughs> when I went to Amazon, I found some lights, I read the reviews, and <laughs> I read some reviews and I Okay, so for the final part of this video, am I too high here? Let's see.